Do you love your favorite cheat meal or dessert, but then the next morning you wake up feeling like gross and bloated? Well, I have found this new greens super powder that helps with that. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors, Like a Kitten. If you want to spice up your sex life with a custom curated box made just for you with your choice of sex toys, lingerie, and games, go to likeakitten.com slash holly to get 20% off your first box. All right. So let's introduce my guest. She is the epitome of a badass woman. She is a femdom fetish porn producer and model. She is in a polyandry total power exchange relationship with multiple submissive partners. And she's a mother of twins. Welcome to the show all the way from Romania, the matriarch Izada Sin. Hi, Izada. How are you? Hello, Holly. Oh, very nervous. I'm a big fan of your show. I'm watching you for years, I think, from wow. almost the beginning. That's and amazing. Now I'm here. So you're here. <laughs> yes. That is, oh my gosh, that is so great. Well, thank you so much. That's a wonderful compliment. And we kind of were talking a little bit before the show. I like, I know people watch the show because I see the numbers, but I still like, there's still like a disconnect in my head where I'm like, people don't really watch this show. Like, so I don't know. I'm always surprised when people say that they're a listener. It just, it never fails to shock me. So, so thank you for that. Um, So I want to talk about this word polyandry because that threw me. I had actually never, I thought it was a typo and it was polyamory, but it is not. So you're going to teach me a new vocabulary word, which is so exciting because, I mean, I thought I knew everything, but obviously not. So what does polyandry mean? Well, it comes from poly, multiple, Mm -hmm. and andros, which means men, so multiple men. Uh, Polyamory, it means multiple partners. Polygamy, Mm -hmm. it means multiple wives. So polyandry means multiple husbands. Because in my relationships, I am the only one. My partners are monogamous to me, but I have several partners. You know, it's kind of indicative of the patriarchal society that we live in. Sorry, guys, that I didn't know that word, that I had never heard that word before. And I know polyamory and I know like polygamy, but like polyandry, where there's multiple male partners, um, monogamous to one woman was a word I'd never come across before, which is crazy. So um, obviously uh, you have a unique story to tell. Unfortunately, it's not that common. And um, outside the fetish world, there are several very small um, places where women do take more husbands. Usually, basically they live in matriarchal societies one way or another. But usually, I suppose, is not very uh, common. So it's easy not to find out about it unless you are really interested in it. Right. So tell us about how you got started in the industry and how everything led to the place that you are now with your multiple male partners. All right. So I'm coming from the lifestyle. That means before I was making a business out of my passion, I was doing it just because I liked it. Um, That means femdom and BDSM to be more specific. So sometimes around 2004, 2005, while I was doing my master degree, I had um, a job that was very convenient for me because it was flexible, it was a hotline, um, a sex a sex phone chat mm-hmm. and there was 
for the first time, when I had the chance to discuss with people, men, submissive men, who had fantasies to be feminized or to be um, penetrated with a strap-on and different kinds of things like that. And um, I was intrigued. And I remember with some of them, I did something which was not really... Um, I was not allowed, but I gave them my private phone number so I could chat with them because it was so interesting. Now, with all the experience that I have, I know for a fact that they were just saying fantasies. There was one of them I was fascinated. He was telling me how the wife would take him to a vacation where nobody will know them and will force him to wear high heels and corsets and it basically the feminization fantasy, forced feminization fantasy. And I was like, wow, this is exactly what I want. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, I started to look over the internet and I found some websites, message boards. I started to discuss with more people. And after a year or so, just talking with people because I was too afraid to meet one of those perverts. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I um, finally got the courage to meet someone and um, I started to just meet people for um, femdom sex, just, mm -hmm. just for the pleasure of it, which usually do not actually, um, it's not about sexual penetration, of course, lots of sexual activities, but not the vanilla mainstream sex, more like mm -hmm. Right, right. Lick my feet, kiss my boots, and things right. like that, which, in my opinion, is also sex because mm -hmm. it gives me sexual pleasure. And then, yeah, but it's not like what's we, what most of us in society like, um, the, our definition of sex, which is basically vaginal penetration, um, with a penis, or, which, you know, or, I've learned from doing this, <laughs> yeah, or yeah, other places, um, which I've learned from this podcast, though, that uh, like sex doesn't have to, mean that specifically. So, um, so how did, like, what was it about this kind of lifestyle? Like, um, you know, feminizing men, what, what about it appealed to you? Like, why do you think that you were attracted to this kind of play? After all these years, I have to tell you that feminization, it's not one of my fantasies anymore. However, control is, and I'm not sure exactly why, but I really like the idea of being in total control over my partners. And that means over their sexuality, over the way they dress, what they eat, what the schedule is, I want them to work for me and so on. And in my mind, when he was telling me about all these fantasies, I was thinking, oh, she's doing with him whatever she wants. This is so hot. So basically, in time, experiencing a lot of things, I realized that the only thing that actually makes me tick is the, is the control, to know that somebody will willingly follow my lead because he trusts me, because he considers me superior to him. And in a way, this is how I see it, because he loves me and mm -hmm. I suppose somehow in my mind, these notions are, are very much connected. If somebody will submit to me totally, like giving himself to me body and soul, that means he really loves me. Mm. So <laughs> that's... <laughs> why do you think, have they ever, has one of your partners ever told you why they're into playing the role that they do? So my main partner is my husband and mm -hmm. he is naturally a switch, but mm -hmm. we are in a total power exchange relationship, 24 seven total power exchange relationship. Mm -hmm. That means I am in total control over him. I take all the decisions in our family and so on. This doesn't mean I am like a dictator. Oh, you'll do that. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's mm -hmm. more like a traditional patriarchal couple where the roles are switched. Basically, 
I am the one initiating the sex all the time. I am the one deciding what uh, he will wear for me. I am the one deciding where, where to go. Like, this is our date night and I want to have cocktails and things like that. And of course, when we have decisions, important decisions, we discuss and I take the veto, like <laughs> if you can say, so you'll consider his side, but ultimately you get to make the decision. Yes, this is our negotiations, but mm-hmm. as, as you can imagine, it's, he wants to be here and he trusts my judgment. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I he, he's a very, um, he has a very strong personality and, I think what makes him willing to submit is that he sees that I have qualities that he do not have, and he has qualities that will complete my um, my lack of <laughs> qualities mm-hmm. in a certain area. Mm-hmm. So basically, we are perfect complements to each other. Yeah. And uh, since we are together 11 years almost, um, we are both the best versions our, of ourselves from everything, starting with our sex life, love, family, finances, and so on. So basically, it, it's a um, it's a team that works. Mm-hmm. And um, yes, <laughs> so it's good. That's that's. Uh, I have more questions about that, but I want to I want to go back mm-hmm. uh, to something else before I forget. So, how many male partners do you have right now? I have seven male partners, That's but a lot of work. <laughs> yes, but with not everyone requires the same amount of time and mm-hmm. um, implications emotionally or otherwise from my part. Mm-hmm. Basically, my husband is my primary, and we live together with our twins, and we are like a regular couple. We are legally married. And I have a very close boy. He is actually an American. He moved all the way from from United States when he wow. retired. Yes, to to be my living boy. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not living in my house. Uh, he rented a house very close to mine. Like I can see his <laughs> window, mm-hmm. and uh, he is there at my beck and call. So every time I want something, sometimes important things like. I want you to come and tidy up my bedroom every day, for example, and, Mm -hmm. you know, make a little bit of a maid service. But also sometimes if in the middle of the night, I feel like, oh, you know what? I really want a Coca-Cola Zero. Usually I don't buy it because I think it's not healthy, but right now I'm craving, go get it. So things like that. Wow. That, wow. Um, So, no, obviously... I'm sure you don't take everybody who applies, right? So what do you, like, how do you decide what male partners you will take on? Do they have to apply? Do they have to like fill anything out? And like, what, what qualities do they have to have that you'll consider them? That's an amazing question. Thank you for asking because (laughs) it's, it's a great way to put it out there. Um, So I'm creating femdom content for 10 years now. So on the femdom scene, I'm extremely popular. If I would take in consideration every man who would like to serve me in one capacity or another, I would go crazy. I would have no time for anything. There would be 1,000 Ezada needed for that. So mm-hmm. <laughs> in order to choose someone, although there is not a very clear process, it's how I feel the connection goes. Of course, at the beginning, when I was in less relationships or I was looking for something specific, I was more open to start new relationships. As the time goes and I feel myself overwhelmed with, you know, answering messages, uh, doing lots of, um, well, interaction, basically, which is nice when you are with one, two, three, four partners. But when you have plenty, it can be very tiring. So. I found myself in the um, in the place where I just have to put strict limits that my harem, I like to call them my harem, mm-hmm. um, as a joke, 
<laughs> because <laughs> harem means women actually and it's a polygamy relationship but i like to call them this way so um the thing is when i was still looking for something like who you know what i really like a boy who is this and that very open to do this kind of fetish so i would i would look through the ones that I'm in contact with, maybe 100 boys, and I will see which one will fit the best the cr criteria. And I will start to develop a relationship from there. Usually after six months, one year of online interaction, I would invite them to meet and we will spend a day together. We will see how things are going. They will receive maybe a collar, a training collar, which is like an engagement ring. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, the relationship will be negotiated more and more. Like um, right now from the all seven partners that I have, I am in the process of having another move in with me. Well, in, in Bucharest, Romania, he is from England mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's a process. We are talking about it for several years and he needs to change the job. He, it's difficult to find a job in Romania. I will probably hire him, but, you know, it's a lot to consider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so but, when you said move yes. in with you, but you don't mean into your house, you just mean into your country? Um, I mean into my... Yes, not into my house, mm -hmm. my basic family. Your world. My world. I, I live in a gated community, actually, mm -hmm. and <laughs> there are plenty of houses that can be used for this purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I want them to move near me, but not in the same house with me. God, wouldn't that be amazing if you had a gated community in every house and there was like one of your man? one of like your male part, like one of your male slaves. And it was just a gated community. which was just filled with men who served you. That feels like a show or something or a movie or something like that. Actually, this is one of my wildest fantasies. And I have to tell you that I was thinking about it. Like in Romania land, land, it's still quite affordable. So I was thinking mm -hmm. maybe to buy a very big plot of land and make like a adult only femdom village where people can come in vacations. Well, I will live there all the time, of course, yeah. uh, when the kids will grow and <laughs> leave home yeah. and uh, people will come and will live for one weekend or one week or two weeks in total power exchange femdom relationships where women can actually walk men on the leash on the street naked or in just a tutu or just a chastity or, or something like that. So this is a, a wild dream that I have, but I no. do not. I think <laughs> you say it. Huh? <laughs> I think it needs to happen. I'm like picturing this now and this sounds fucking amazing. Like how fun would that be? That would be, that would be so cool. Like a trip to Romania. It's like such a romantic country. And, and then it's just this whole, like, I, I feel like, I feel like people would do, I feel like that would sell that. I think when you're ready you have an investor, all right? <laughs> and you're ready for this. <laughs> Will you come? Because I know you've said it many times in your in your shows that usually your fantasies are more towards submissive fantasies. Yes. But I, I'll, I you know, I'll come and I'll observe. I'll I'll do I'll shoot. I'll come as a journalist. I'll do some <laughs> interviews. I'll document it. That sounds amazing. Uh, that sounds really cool. I, I have a theory where in femdom, because it's such a vast buffet of activities, I think everyone, no matter if it's men or women, dominant, submissive, doesn't matter. There is something that can enjoy in, in femdom. This is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, God, talk about opening doors. That would be so cool. So... Um, at one point you were let go from a job when they found out about your kinks. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? And was that the first time that you felt the stigma of sex work? So after I finished my studies, because my parents are teachers and they always encourage me to have like a, a very secure job that, you know, very clear. I was at the beginning very much against anything that is like sex work because first of all 
I, I don't think I, I cared about the stigma, but I cared a lot like it's not something secure at the end of the mm-hmm. month. Maybe you will yeah. win a lot or maybe you will do not win anything. So yes. because of that, I was naively very open with my sexuality. I had a blog where I was share op- opinions about that. I would go to different uh, sex clubs when I traveled and I, I wrote about my experiences there, femdom experience. So I was really naughty putting pictures around. So <laughs> that's it. And at some point it was, um, I think in 2009, it was when the, um, um the market crashed and uh, lots of people were let go and I was let go. And at first I thought I'm not good enough out of the whole team. I was the worst <laughs> to let mm-hmm. me go. And uh, a, a colleague told me that, oh, don't be upset because actually I will tell you the, because they found out about your website and um, all your kings and this would not be good for the uh, image of the company, which I completely understand and i have to say that i don't totally assume that i was out there i was putting their pictures i was putting their uh, stories blog entries about all the kinks that i was doing so i really didn't care about mm-hmm. you know you weren't trying to hide it in any way yeah. no no not at all i was always very open and honest but i na- naively thought that this will not interact with what I was doing for a living. It was just an office job. It's not nothing important. So that's it. Yeah. So how, how was transitioning into doing full-time sex work like for you? Was it difficult at the beginning? Did you ever have moments of um, insecurity about whether or not you could actually make it work? You know, I was extremely lucky. So... I started to do clips uh, back in 2010 in, um, with another production company called OWK. And um, that's a village like the one we discussed before. <laughs> and <laughs> there I met uh, one gentleman who was very interested to meet me again in Romania. And at the beginning, I thought he he's saying like that he was there for filming he was one of the male models and i was the dominant woman who would beat them and uh, he actually came to visit me in bucharest after around six months from our first meeting and then we continued to see each other in different locations usually traveling together I was in a relationship with him when i was fired and he offered to pay for my monthly expenses, which at that time were around 600 euro per month. I remember very well that (laughs) sum uh, to cover for all my expenses. So I can just, you know, go on with my lifestyle without caring about doing something that I don't want. Of course, the discussion was not really like that. It was more like what I'm doing right now. And he offered that. And it was also convenient because not having a job, I was able to travel more with him. And it was easier to just have a better, more fulfilling relationship together. So Mm -hmm. that was my very, very big luck because when I started, and he also helped me to buy my first uh, video camera, actually. So when I started, I was very lucky to have this financial security, which would cover for my expenses then. And I never had to do anything that I didn't want to do, or I was like, "Uh, I don't know if I want to do this, and so on. And um, At around the same time, I started my relationship a little bit after my relationship with my husband. And uh, he was not really into femdom, but very kinky and open-minded. Not enough experiences in kink, but lots of experiences with himself. (laughs) So (laughs) the the seed was there. (laughs) And um, we started, um, I was always very much into probably, I think also Medor, my partner who who helped me uh, 
after I was fired, he was very much into taking pictures and video of us. And I think he planted that seed. And when I started my relationship with my husband, I also used the camera to record myself. Because the way it goes, when you do a BDSM play, when you whip somebody, when you have him crawling at your boots, it feels good. It feels like you feel power, you you are aroused. But most of the time, there is not a climax. There is not Mm. that sexual charge that will make me go off. Mm -hmm. And usually I feel myself doing that. And then I will watch myself and masturbate or watch myself and have sex with my partner, like penetrative sex. Mm -hmm. So I would leave that experience both in my imaginations, but also looking at it and listening to myself and so on. So this is how it started. And I thought I should publish some clips on Chris for Sale, clips Mm -hmm. that I made with my husband. The first one's really poor. (laughs) <laughs> but people liked them very much. I had no lights. It was really like very basic. My English is not very good now, but it was worse back then. But I don't know. People, I think, enjoy to see how genu- genuine the play was because it was me with my partners. So this is how I started. From the first, the first check was really good, more than I ever one before. So, wow. Well, I will say, first of all, your English is fantastic. Um, (laughs) so don't, don't be nervous about that. Um, and I was looking at the photos that you sent me and some other stuff that you published and your stuff's really high quality now. I mean, it's very, I don't know what it was like then, but it's, it's beautiful. It's really well done. Um, it has a very Ken Marcus vibe to it. I don't know if you know who he is. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm not that much into mainstream porn. <laughs> so except yeah. except for watching your shows on YouTube, I have no idea about any lady that or men that you invite there. Actually, I have to Google them to see who, who they are. I have absolutely no I'm not watching mainstream yeah. porn at all. Um, well, it sounds like you have a lot on your hands. You've got seven partners and you've got two babies and, um, and a business to run. So we're going to, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Azada's, uh, family life. We're going to talk about the difference between, um, the lifestyle, uh, sub Dom relationship and what you see on camera and, um, so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. I am a big dessert lover. I absolutely have to have my sugar fix at night. And especially if I go out to dinner, there's no way I'm not ordering dessert, but then I feel really gross the next morning. So that's why I'm so excited about Bloom. It really helps me with my digestion and my bloating issues so that I can wake up the next morning feeling great. Bloom Greens are packed with over 50 nutrients, including whole fruits and veggies, fiber, probiotics, antioxidants, and more, all in one easy to drink formula. Mix it in with water or a smoothie to add to your daily routine. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. That's B-L-O-O-M-N-U.com slash holly to get 15% off your order. Take charge of your mornings and get into that daily routine that's going to make you feel your best with Bloom Nutrition. All right, guys, we are back. So Azada, tell us a little bit about um, what are your relationships like, these these power exchange relationships like? What are they like actually in reality? And are are they different than what we see in your clips um, or on camera? So with my clips, most of my clips, I try to show the reality as it is, maybe using a little bit more of my fantasy than what the actual is going on. For example, I have lots of fantasies where I keep my partners prisoners for 24 hours, 48 hours, which is usually do not happen. It happened Mm. several times, like 30 times, let's say, in 10 years of that, because Mm -hmm. it's quite challenging for both. But the fantasy is there, so we can 
try to imagine that, like putting him for just a couple of hours into the cage. And then when I'm coming back, I can pretend not only for the camera, but also for us, like mm -hmm. what I'm saying, that he was there overnight. So that that is something that is, is different. Also, sometimes I have custom clipped requests, which are more rare now, in which I'm really acting. And sometimes I have to act in ways that I, it's not really myself. I don't think I'm a good actress. So I decided most of the time not to take custom requests anymore because it, it's, it's, I think my style, it's quite sensual. And mm -hmm. when I have a request where I have to speak dirty and be really mean, and I don't think it's me. And mm -hmm. I think my success comes from being genuine and to be myself and sometimes doing things which are not classical femdom, but I'm still doing them because this is what I like. And if I like, for sure, there will be some people who would like the same thing that I like as well. So what do you I mean when you say, what do you mean when you say that you do something that's not classical femdom? Like, could you give us an example? Yes, I can give you an example. Cuckolding, which is a very big fantasy. And in the cuckold world, most of the time, the hot wife would be attracted to big penises, having sex with multiple partners. She's the party girl doing, you know, lots of things, but, I'm not that. I mean, in, in when I was younger, I had several time nightstands or I, I had sex with people that I was not emotionally connected with. But now in my 40s, the best sex can be only with my husband because mm -hmm. we trust each other, we love each other. And although we have an open relationship, if I want to have sex with somebody else, I can. Uh, I choose to be just with him for penetrative sex because this is I like to feel emotionally connected with the person that I am intimate with not only for penetrative sex but also for for femdom activities so because of that I do cuckolding where my husband is the bull and mm -hmm. the other although he's also a submissive to me and the other boys must be the cuckold. Well, some of them are the cuckolds. So this is not typical and classical. And uh, it, oh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So you only have penetrative sex with your husband, but you have six other partners who are monogamous to you, right? So then does that mean that they don't have sex at all? Or do you allow them to have sex with other people? Do you have different rules? for different partners, excluding your husband, of course, which I understand is a different relationship. Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, I have different rules for different people. And I was telling you at the beginning that out of the seven relationships, they are not all just as intimate as um, uh, the next one. So mm -hmm. with my husband, he's my primary, the boy who lives with me, uh, next to me, actually, mm -hmm. he is also my partner. Actually, I keep him locked in chastity all the time. And this is the key from his chastity device. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, most of my partners are locked in chastity most of the time. And they are not allowed to have um, sex of any kind with anyone. However, mm -hmm. uh, two of my partners are married. And they are allowed, I don't know if they do, but they are allowed to have sex with their wives. Actually, this is a rule that I have. I believe that if a man is in another relationship, I prefer the wife to know. And if she doesn't know, I want her to be treated at least as good as they are treating me. Because this is the concept of matriarchy. Right. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. So do these two partners that are married, do they, do their wives know? 
Uh, yes, one of them is my first partner, Medor, that I was telling you about. I'm in a relationship with him for 12 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And the wife knows. Um, they are rather old. I don't think they they have any sexual intercourse anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, she knows about me. Actually, they they used to play BDSM uh, at the beginning of their relationship, and then she mm -hmm. decided she, she is not into it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, allowed him to to go and see a dominatrixes um he is allowed most of the time him in particular uh, when we play he's allowed to masturbate in front of me other mm -hmm. men are allowed to ejaculate um i masturbate them with my hand or with mm -hmm. the use of sexual toys or maybe with a foot job um sometimes with a couple three Three, four, four of them are allowed to offer me oral services, licking uh, my ass yeah. or, or my mm -hmm. sanctum. Uh, actually, for the sanctum, only my husband at this moment. I used to have another one, but uh, not anymore. So, <laughs> 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 so yes, it's very specific. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's so in that's so interesting. So, God, I have, like so many questions. Um, <laughs> so okay, so. You say that you have them locked in chastity. Are they actually wearing chastity belts or are we talking more of like a, like a mental chastity? Both. Um, my, th of course, I like the idea of a, of a chastity device, mm -hmm. but I think, and over the years, having all this experience that actually the only chastity that matters is the mental chastity. Mm -hmm. Basically, if I give them permission to touch themselves, if I give them permission to ejaculate, they will. Otherwise, they will not. And it's a trust, of course. I cannot make sure he will. they will not do it. Uh, it it's a trust thing. They trust my judgment. They trust that from obtaining uh, and postponing the climax, when they will be allowed, it will be more pleasant, more intense, more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, and I think it happens a lot with men nowadays, because porn is so widely available and it's so easy to, to see it, to just have a masturbation before you go to sleep, to, to make that orgasm not to matter anymore. And I think it's mm -hmm. a pity because it can be such an important, amazing um, sensation if you just work for it a bit more. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's like if you eat cake all the time, then it's just cake. But if you only have cake on your birthday, then it's like very yes. special. So <laughs> yes, I understand that. So do men ever, uh, <laughs> masturbate without your permission? And if they do, do they call you or like tell you, and then like they have to be punished? Um, and, what are your rules for that? Like, is there a situation where if somebody breaks the rules enough times and you let them go? I will definitely not let go someone just because he masturbated without permission. However, I mean, that is not important. And actually it, it's a subject that I am very willing to negotiate a lot, depending on the person that I am with. And, um, for example, uh, my husband is allowed to have once a week, one orgasm. And uh, it's like uh, Friday, it's our date night, which is now. <laughs> and uh, usually he's I'm ruining. To... Am I ruining your date night? <laughs> oh, after I talked with you about all this, I'm going downstairs where he's waiting, horny. <laughs> 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 this is the foreplay. <laughs> I'm sorry if this is not consensual for you, but in my mind, I have lots of non-consensual <laughs> fantasies. Are you kidding like me? That. This is great. This is great. I've never been the foreplay to somebody else's session. So this is awesome. I love it. <laughs> oh, I'm all red. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, sorry. So your husband's allowed to orgasm once a week, um, mm -hmm. tonight, uh, tonight, yes. tonight, <laughs> maybe. And, 
<laughs> Big well, maybe I, you are the boss. So um. yes, exactly. He he. I have a rule. He he must make me climax at least ten times before he will be allowed to have an, an orgasm, and there will be a ruined orgasm most of the time. So <laughs> wait, ten times in one night, or just like over the span of the week? Oh, th- that doesn't matter. It can be one night. He's really good. He was very bad at the beginning when I met him, but now he's really good. Yes, I can climax wow. 10 times. That's not possible for me. I can't do it more than once. Like once I come, I'm like, get away from me. Don't touch me. I'm like, I'm done. Like there is not a second <laughs> one. There's definitely not a 10th one. So that's amazing. <laughs> I think I'm lucky because the first one is harder to achieve, but after that, they come like that. It's really yeah. nice. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, it's just interesting. Women are so different, you know, like I know, I know other women who can like have multiple orgasms. Um, Should I go back during- about the orgasm? Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Because sorry, we- yes. We um, so, so, so sit, my living boy was complaining. He has an app where he keeps the like, when was the last time? And time to time, he's telling me it was 87 days and 12 hours since <laughs> my last ejaculation. I had three ejaculations in one day. And one time it was 450 something. That's because I don't keep track and I really mm-hmm. do not care. I mean, sometimes I play with him, I tease him. But if I feel like, you know, it's not the time, I will just put him back in chastity and Mm -hmm. he started to complain about that a little bit first just hints then Mm -hmm. he told me that oh other boys get to come every week why i cannot a little bit of passive aggression like Mm -hmm. most submissive men do and i decided to give him tasks and i said "How, how many orgasms do you want to have in a week let's do this task and i wanted him to do by himself to see what is the perfect number of orgasms for him. But I didn't want to go to the trouble. Uh, So he had to masturbate first once a week, then twice a week and so on. But he he never took the chances. I would ask him, so you did it the way I told you? Oh, no, I was busy with this and that. And say, okay, if you don't want to do it, then (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) maybe you don't need it. So it depends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you're, so you're open to negotiation because I think one thing that, um, you know, I come across, uh, when I speak to people who are in BDSM that I think a lot of outsiders don't understand is that there's always like a boundary and consensual negotiation before play happens. So you let the guys kind of tell you like how far they're willing to go, what they need. And then you, do you, how much do you adjust according to like what they want? Actually, I'm willing to adjust the relationship to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to renegotiate what's going on in our relationship. And I always try to take more control, making sure that they they want to give me that control. And Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And I think that's why I have so many very successful, very long relationships, because I I have rules, of course, but I understand that each person is different. And when I choose to be in a relationship with somebody, I was looking for different personalities, people who can bring me different things in my life, happiness in a different shape and form than the other one, because I don't want to have... Uh, three similar (laughs) husbands, I Mm -hmm. want one to be an introvert and one to be an extrovert and one to be a little bit feminine and one to be very masculine and so on. So I appreciate their unicity and I try to make them be the best version of themselves, as happy as they can be so they can make me happy. But when it comes to play, I'm not willing to negotiate. And actually with most of my relationships, the ones that are really important and the trust is there and we have our test, uh, blood test done. So, so basically uh, anything goes, Mm -hmm. I'm expecting that they would, they would trust me so much that I have right of life and death over them. If if you Mm -hmm. understand what it means, of course, I want them to be good and I want them to be healthy and I don't want them to be in danger, but I'm expecting if I want something to happen, like I want you to suck my husband dick now, Mm -hmm. he must do it. 
mm. although that might which not could be, be his which fantasy. could be life and death for some. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I test the waters <laughs> before I would take them there. Right. I, uh, yes, it, it's a question of, of trust. Basically, I want the I, I'm negotiating the relationships, but not so much the play because mm -hmm. it's very important for me to know that they trust me so much, they trust my judgment so much, and they trust that I know about them more than they know about themselves. Because very often with submissive men, that's the case. And I help them discover fantasies and feelings and sensations, which maybe they never thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. God, there's so much psychology um, involved in what you do. It's so fascinating. Um, you recently made a YouTube video about playing mental femdom games. Can you explain maybe one of them to our audience? Mm, I love them. When I started to be interested in BDSM, I was very much about um, physical things, doing this or that activities. But then you understand that it's not so much about the activity itself, but what the person that you are playing with feel about it, how they perceive it, because the same activity can be different from one person to another. Someone who would, let's say, kiss my foot in the middle of the street in front of everyone may feel very shy about it and really humiliated, but other men can feel very, very proud of themselves. Look, I'm, I'm her property. I will do this. So when I do mental games, I'm always usually they work the best when you know the person very well. So you have to play inside the mind of the person and guide him in the direction that will make him feel in the way you want, maybe vulnerable, uh, maybe very deeply humiliated and, and so on. Um, I can give you an example, um, but I think there are, I don't know if I have right now, because you, you took me by surprise, something that I, I haven't said in the video, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can, I can say one of the, um, I don't think I have another example right now of my hat. No, I think <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that's good. I mean, um, <laughs> It's, it, you, it seems like you really take time to like cultivate a relationship with these men and, and you really get to know them before you ask things of them that might seem like a lot to people, right? Yes, because I think the value of somebody offering himself to you comes when he will do things that he is not immediately consent to. Basically, mm -hmm. if somebody would come to me and say, oh, I want to kiss your feet, oh, goddess, then anybody can kiss my feet. Why should I choose you? You have to prove mm -hmm. yourself to show me that you, you are worthy to be there because I can have, I already have very successful, very fulfilling relationships. So if you, if you want to be part of my inner circle, my lifestyle, you really have to give yourself completely. And mm. I feel like I give a lot of myself too in these relationships. So it's just fair to. Yeah. Yeah. To it sounds like that. a lot of work. Um, speaking of a lot of work, you're a mother, you have twins. Can I ask how old they are? Yes. They are four years and three months now or four wow. months. Okay. Wow. That. So they are like, they're at that age where they are running Don't amok and you know, I, yeah, I, I mean, my girl's <laughs> a year and a half now and wow, it is a different story when they can walk. It's funny because I remember when I first found out I was pregnant, part of me was like, oh, I hope it's twins. Cause then, you know, I wanted two and I can get like two over with and then I'm done and I don't have to have any more. And then once I had her, I was like, how do people do it with twins? This is so much work with one. So first of all, kudos to you for doing, having twins. That's crazy. I just, I can't even imagine. And then secondly, so, um, we've already talked about your relationship with your husband and that he's submissive to you. Um, did your relationship change at all when you had kids, when you got pregnant? 
amazing question. Yes, yes, our relationship changed a lot. First of all, watching my husband helping me throughout my pregnancy, and I had lots of problems during my pregnancy. They were premature and uh, lots of issues. And then watching, uh, yeah, it happens often with twins, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still uh, scarred emotionally from that, but <laughs> it's what it is. Um, anyway, going back to that, um, I think I've seen um, my husband as a father and made me fall in love with him, of him as a father, because it, it's different when you are in love with your partner as a lover, and then you love him as a father for your children, taking care of them and so on. So that was important. Also, um, because I had twins and they were premature and it was lots of work and they were not sleeping, um, his parents, my husband's parents, my parents-in-law uh, moved. Um, they are from Moldo Moldova, actually, which is another country. So they moved to, to help us. They are still living next to us. The kids are with <laughs> my, my uh, parents-in-law right now. So they help us. And before they moved, my husband negotiated with me not to wear the collar 24-7 because he was wearing it before and not to wear the chastity device. Um, well, that happens when the children arrive because although a chastity device is discreet, when you play with the kids, you take them in, in your arms, you know, yeah. maybe that can be felt and it will feel yeah. weird. Yeah. So... I was um, with the chastity totally, yes, I totally agree. I would probably had this idea if he didn't mm -hmm. come with it. But with the color, I'm still a little bit, um, I'm thinking I should introduce it again because I missed it. And he's wearing it when we are alone. The problem is now at this age, because if, if he would have wear the, the collar all the time, that would be absolutely, as Sit does, it would be mm -hmm. absolutely normal for the kids to, you know, the, it's just jewelry. Yeah. They will not put right. the value on it. But if now I will make him wear the collar again, the kids are big enough to ask questions which are difficult mm -hmm. to, to answer. So my approach is never to lie to them. And to be, of course, discreet with my sex life, which is absolutely normal. But any question that they would have at some point to ask as open as possible according to their age. So I don't think I would be ever, um, I will be able ever to introduce the caller again, at least mm -hmm. not when they are children. But um, that was one thing that was important. And also lots of things are happening in, in our lifestyle, which I think are good. Um, and I realized how they see everything and they will, they are like sponges. And I will give you one example. Uh, in, in my household, uh, there are several activities that I don't do. For example, driving. I know how to drive, but absolutely hate it. And my husband drives all the time. And we have a little electric car for the twins. And the girl, she never wants to drive because mommy does not drive. Only boys drive. And this is not something <laughs> I really want to teach her. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but she's seeing that. On the other hand, mm -hmm. she knows that uh, mommy does not clean. Only boys do. <laughs> so, so <that's>, yeah. <laughs> I don't mind that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting how they they pick up stuff. I mean, I just I I broke down and bought my daughter like a fake makeup kit because she's always trying to grab my lipstick and my makeup and you know put it on. So I bought her like a fake one and I was like here and she's just, you know like fascinated with it. But yeah, you don't you don't realize it and it's it's funny too because she, <laughs> my husband um, 
you know, he makes like grunts and groans sometimes when he like squats down to pick something up just because like he's got kind of a bad knee and he plays hockey, which puts a lot of like strain on his body. So he'll always be like, oof, or something like that when he picks something up. And she does that now too. She'll pick something up. She's like, oof. I'm like, you're this close to the ground. Like that wasn't that hard to do. <laughs> it is, it is so funny to see how they pick up everything. It's crazy. <clears throat> yes. So lots of change, lots of things changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. So then, um, you said that you have a, like your neighbor sub who comes over to help clean and stuff like that. Did they just think he's like a friend of the family? I assume. I mean, they're kind of too yes. young to really ask questions anyways about that relationship. Right. Yes. I decided that all my partners will be an active part in uh, my twins life because mm -hmm. I don't, I want to normalize my relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's anything, everything that a child will think it's strange is because we as adults present it as such. If That's they so true. see it around it as normality, then they will never ask questions. So uh, Sid, my, my other partner is part of the family, more or less, because he doesn't speak Romanian yet. So it's difficult for him to, to be, um, to come to dinners, for example, mm -hmm. although the twins do speak English. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yes, he used to be a dance teacher. So they do every week dance lessons with Sid and uh, yes, it's, it's like part of the family or, or like yeah. a friend. Yeah. Yes. And when they will, if they will start asking questions, it will be the first will be like, he's working for me, which is true mm -hmm. because he does. And when they will grow, like I will go from there because I, yeah. I think there is a different, basically the, the true, they, I will always tell them the true, but I think the answer can different depending of their age because yeah, <laughs> right no, now. absolutely. I can tell, I mean, I can tell you from experience because, you know, my parents worked in the adult industry and raised, you know, me and my brother and my sister and they never lied to us, but yeah, it was, it was all about, you know, learning different things at, at the right age, you know, and at the beginning it was just, you know, mom and dad make movies and take pictures for grownups and it's for grownups. It's not for kids. And that was, you know, like I didn't, question like, well, what does that mean? Like, what is something for grown? You know, as a child, you're just like, okay, these are the boundaries. This is for grownups. You know, these are for children and, you know, driving's for grownups, not for children, that kind of thing. So, um, and then, you know, later it, we, but I don't remember ever like finding out what they did and it being this huge shock and surprise and, oh my God, how could you, it was just something that, I don't know. We always knew or something like that. I, I, I don't remember. There was never like this moment of finding out. It was just something that was a part of our lives and wasn't really, you know, that important to us because my parents didn't make our lives about like what they did for a living. Our lives were about, you know, spending time together and doing things that kids like to do and going to the beach and going to the park and riding horses and having lunch together and, you know, like things that parents do with their kids. So I just know that this is a question that people always ask. And a lot of other sex workers too, like want to know, you know, how do they tell their children this kind of thing? And I think the approach that you're taking, which says conversations don't lie, but age appropriate conversations as time goes on. Makes sense. Yes. Uh, my biggest fear is that colleagues from school will find out before I will have the chance to actually explain to them more. So, yeah. for example, parents, what I do for a living, it's quite niche, although now with uh, my YouTube channels and, you know, I'm out there and I believe it's more likely for other parents to see me, to recognize me, maybe tell the children and then the, the children to tell mine. And mm -hmm. I think that might be a problem because definitely they would not feel good to find out from somebody else about that. But, yeah. Yes. I mean, I can tell you that a, uh, a boy once when I was in, how old I must've been like eight or something like that ish. 
I remember a boy brought a penthouse magazine to school and my mom had a layout in it that she'd shot. And, um, you know, everyone was, there was actually some confusion because he thought that my mom was the model in it, not the woman who took the pictures. But anyways, um, but I can tell you that like, it was not a surprise to me. Like I, I knew that my mom did it at the time. So it was never revealed to me by anybody else. But again, I think just having, you know, that open, honest relationship with them and, um, you'll figure it out. You know, yeah, you'll figure it out. We, we That's all we can all do. <laughs> One day at a time. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, Zada, I don't want to uh, deny your husband his orgasm any longer. So, <laughs> And mine. <laughs> yes, and yours, of course. What? Sorry. But, I mean, you do get them more frequently than he does, so. But yes, of course. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for coming on. This has been so interesting. I know that we started talking about um, this interview a long time ago, and I'm so glad that we finally made it happen um, because this has been super fascinating. And so I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time. Thank you. Thank you. It was really amazing. Yes. <laughs> and then can you tell everybody where they can find you? Um, I know you've got a YouTube channel. Um, your social media, uh, all that stuff? Well, I think it's easier if they will just go and visit my YouTube channel, which is talkingmatriarchy.com, or mm -hmm. they will just search Ezada on YouTube. And I think from there, if they really are interested to find out more, then there is the link with all my links and they can find everything there. I'm not on Instagram. There are just lots of scammers pretending they are mm -hmm. me. I'm on Twitter and fairly active. I have one very kinky account, which is popular and one which is very personal, but it's there. They can find it. So if somebody has any questions or it's out in there and thank you so much for this opportunity. It was amazing for me to talk about this. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been um, an eye opener for me. And I learned a new word. I learned a new word. Um, I know. Polyandry. I'm so excited. And of course, you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Follow me on TikTok. I'm at Holly Randall Unfiltered. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching or listening. And I'll see you next week.